the computer museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015, brought to you by Mirantis. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Brick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live here in Silicon Valley. This is the Cube, Silicon Angle Media's flagship program. We go out to the events to extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Jeff Frick. Two days of wall to wall coverage again, OpenStack Summit, I mean sorry, OpenStack Silicon Valley here in Silicon Valley, of course. One exit down from our office in Palo Alto. We're at the Computer History Museum where all the actions. Jeff, uh, wrap up in this segment on day one. This is the wrap up. Uh, bottom line, I think, um, OpenStack has got some momentum. The Silicon Valley one has more Kool-Aid, I think, than all the shows involved. I mean, given Kool-Aid injection here, the pump up, the hype, Silicon Valley innovation, it's just, it's in the air here, and naturally, to begin with. But now OpenStack is at that point where they need to lap the field. This is the point now where OpenStack needs to throttle it up, break out of the pack, really demonstrate value. A lot of bets are on the table. IBM, Cisco, Intel, a lot of startups looking for that white space to thrive and survive. Startups looking for the M&A. The ones that didn't make it are gone, so this is happening, the developer community is rocking. So in my, my, my assessment, again, a continuation of our theme in Vancouver and Seattle last week, it's time to hit the road. Hit the road, speed it, gas it up, take it to the next level. Well, there's, there's a lot of conversations about there's you know five cloud platforms, five dominant cloud platforms, Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, VMware, and OpenStack. So the question is, is OpenStack legitimately in that fifth spot, which it seems to be, and if not, who's in the sixth that's nipping at their tail? It doesn't seem to be anyone else out there, and so with that, with that opportunity, it does seem like they can secure it, and what, what amazes me again, and, and looking back in the last year since we were here, John, is all the big plays that all the main infrastructure providers have made big bets in this space. They've, they've bought in talent, they've bought in technology, and they seem to be really behind it as this is the way to develop, or to, to deliver and develop the cloud uh, the private cloud for the enterprise. Yeah, and we asked all the people that showed up here in theCUBE um, one question, is hybrid cloud legit, is it real? And we got a variety of answers, and the, the consistent answer is, it's misunderstood. You have technical definitions, Craig McLucky from Google really laid out a cogent argument that hybrid cloud really doesn't exist as a product, and that's a collection of tooling and platforms, abstraction layers, that create an environment for cross-platform interoperability, extending out seamlessly into the Internet of Things, also supported by Lou Tucker on the same front, both technologists, and then others, um, and other technologists and business people all agree, no, hybrid cloud is the top level category, private and public are subordinate underneath. Because ultimately, it's about, you don't care what the resource is, that is notion of hybrid cloud. Again, Jeff, I don't think it's a product, it's not a category, there's no one, two, and three leaders yet, because categorically it's all one pie. So I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a convergence of private and public, ultimately under one category, call it hybrid cloud today, but ultimately the cloud. Well, I think you're right, John. I think if you're the guy that's managing the development in your organization, you need both options, right? You need the public option and you need the private option depending on the workload and the application that you're developing. So you need a hybrid, you need hybrid solutions in terms of where you're going to put things and having options and choices. But within a particular workload, you know, those exist in one space or the other. But then I do think, you know, there is a there is a connection, there's an interface, there's a way that that the private and the public are exchanging information based on the workload requirements. And, you know, we've seen a lot of promotion with Amazon uh, Direct Connect. I thought it was pretty interesting that Monty was talking about, you know, having private clouds inside the same data centers as public clouds in the IBM instance. So there, now, now that we have the Direct Connect that doesn't have the street in the middle and the pipe between the private cloud application and the public cloud application, now we've broken across the street, we're inside the same building, we're inside the same data centers. I like to say, eventually we're going to jump across the sheet metal 
And, and where does that delineation become between the private cloud and the public cloud? The other insight, Jeff, I'd like to share with you and the, and the audience out there is, this is a validation of, of our thesis. Dave and I have talked on theCUBE many times. The dominance of Amazon Web Services continues to impact the big players, Oracle and IBM. Here we have IBM folks saying, and we've confirmed it many times, but clearly saying, hey, we're building a big public cloud. They're taking on Amazon directly with all that trajectory on Amazon. IBM's going to try to move the goalposts and change the game. Clearly, Amazon's being taken on directly by Amazon. In Oracle's um, speech by Larry Ellison at the cloud launch, which we covered live, Larry Ellison replaced IBM's name on this chart with AWS. So again, IBM has always been Oracle's key competitor. Now it's Amazon. IBM has always looked at the market. Now Amazon's in the mix. Again, Amazon Web Services is the competitive target because they're taking territory, that's one. The second insight that I, I would like to share is from Lou Tucker. I asked him the bubble question and what advice he would give first time entrepreneurs and developers who haven't lived through even the dot-com bubble or any cycle of innovation. And he said, you know, the innovation is so great in the enterprise, if developers focus on the technology, they can ride out any bubble. I thought that was the best advice I've heard relative to how to manage the bubble dynamic if you're a first timer. Keep your eye on the technology innovation, not the business and the financial stuff. That'll sort of stuff out. I'm not saying live poor, but don't be making decisions based upon some dynamic in the capital market. So great advice by Lou Tucker, again, legend in the industry. Yeah, absolutely, and, 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 and I thought it was a great point as well. There's the financial side, of the bubble and the unicorns and the billion dollar valuations and all that conversation. And then there's the real rubber meets the road where there is a whole lot of enterprise value being unlocked. I, I go back to it over and over again. It's kind of like the when ERP first came in, when there was just a ton of efficiencies that ERP could wring out of the system and there was a whole nother level of value unlocked. With cloud computing, the elasticity, the orchestration, the availability on demand, the you know not having huge capital investments, you know, you had the VC on talking about how easy it is to do a startup these days. You don't have these tremendous capital demands. I think it is real value, it is real opportunity, and while there may be some bubble valuations in particular instances, uh, at the end of the day, we are living through a pretty dynamic and exciting period in the tech industry. The other comments I'd like to share um, is we had uh, Marantis co-founder on and chairman talking about the funding, 100 million additional top up of the tank, a little dry powder, which is going to be helpful if there's any kind of financial bubble. But moreover, the Intel relationship with Marantis should absolutely take Marantis to a whole nother level. Credit to Marantis for having this event, one, identifying a big void in the market by bringing OpenStack to Silicon Valley and making it not their event. And they bring us in, we're happy to support them uh, here at theCUBE, the second year doing that, huge. He just, Marantis as much as is clear, they want platforms that work. Customers don't care, they want CapEx and OpEx management and workload mobility. The other thing that's interesting is that the cloud native conversation with Google was very uh, important because Craig McLucky really laid out kind of Google's perspective. And I think Google is a great example of a company that's living cloud native, even with all the stuff and all the tentacles of their products and services from search to Android to the X, X, uh, Google X and the moonshots that they're running, Google really has a great position and they have great engineering. So again, that was another great insight and again, this is all about the enterprise, and the enterprise needs new tooling, new technology. So again, OpenStack is poised. I think there's a lot more to do, Jeff. Yep. And you know, hearing Vivek uh, Met Me Metra from uh, August Capital, with Sunit from uh, App AppFormix, um, entrepreneurs are getting older. I mean, he's in, he's been around, I and mean, so. To win in the enterprise, as August Capital's VC general partner pointed out, Vivek, it's not easy. So don't be enamored, you got a prototype, it's act two of the, of the venture development process in the enterprise, he pointed out, I thought was an amazing piece of insight. Uh, Vivek from August Capital, great investor, super conversation with him and his portfolio company from SUNY. Again, he's from ex uh, Microsoft Azure, it's an, it's an old man's game now, I think, in the cloud. So yeah, I'm not going to, yeah. I'm too early to judge that, but maybe the young guns can surprise me. Well, and, and Madura from Platform 9, a bunch of VM, uh, VMware folks that spun out, saw an opportunity to do it a different way and do it with OpenStack. So they've got enterprise experience, they've been doing it uh, at VMware for a long time, and they're another startup. But I do want to just tell everyone, if you, if you haven't watched the Craig McCluckley interview from today, uh, watch it, it was it was very powerful, and I thought the other thing that he said right at the end of, of his interview, John, is 
some people are probably skeptical is you know get involved get involved with Google open source you can get involved in their cloud not necessarily by having to be at Oracle but you can get involved as part of the open source project and it's really a fascinating thing to watch we did open uh, compute project where Facebook is kind of opening the kimono and the way they run at scale Google's kind of opening the kimono and the way that they run at scale where these huge scale internet companies are sharing the way that 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 you do this and enterprises are adopting it via the vehicle of open source. Pretty interesting times. Yeah, and Todd Moore, who was the VP of Open Technologies and Open Platforms at IBM, talked about the innovation on the business model side. I thought that was very relevant. I see Lou Tucker, who we just mentioned earlier, another great interview to watch. But the surprise interview that I wish I had more time to go drill down on was Lisa Marie Nampy from HP. We talked a lot about HP, her book, but one of the things that she's doing that's impressive to me, Jeff, is an area that we're passionate about, and that is women in tech, women in leadership, and diversity um, and in, in technology. And I think what she's doing OpenStack and she was on the panel in Seattle is really compelling. So look for a, a follow up with Lisa Marie on, on that leadership and women in tech and diversity. We're going to be at the Grace Hopper event coming up, which is going to be in Houston, huge event, and you're going to see a lot more coverage, you're getting a lot of requests. So again, tell us more about what's going on there. Yeah, so again, Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. We hadn't heard of it, John, till last year. We actually got tipped off from, from a friend at Intel and it's 10,000 uh, women basically getting excited about technology. And it's not just jobs at technology, companies, it's engineering, it's, it's, it's real technology jobs, it's kind of a hiring, it's a hiring show, uh, it's also you know, showing the leadership, as you said, it's not just women in technology, but it's women in leadership roles, so we're excited this year to bring the whole cube down for three days of coverage, uh, it's going to be fantastic, if you haven't checked it out, Anita Borg Institute, Grace Hopper Celebration of Women Computing, unfortunately if you don't have tickets, I think they sold out in a week, John, so it's, uh, it's on a growth trajectory, but you can watch it live on theCUBE, we'll be there. Yeah. Uh, that's the middle of October. Yeah, and we're going to be back tomorrow with live coverage tomorrow here at OpenStack. Obviously, we've got VMworld next week we're gearing up for. But remember, go to wikibon.com and check out the research. It's really, really growing fast. Uh, I promised uh, Vivek I'd get him some research over at August Capital to take a look at. He was very interested in that. Obviously, a lot of startups are already using it. And siliconangle.com, siliconangle.tv for all the footage and all the videos from today. Uh, and uh, we'll con continue to bring the, the signal from the noise. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow here for day two of OpenStack Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll see you tomorrow, thanks for watching.